minutes, I'm going to power through some intro to tech startup type content. Again, we have a range of people here, people who, you know, work in tech startups already, people who might not truly know what a tech startup is. So bear with me if the content um, is, you know, all over the place. So the first thing to note is startups aren't small businesses. Small businesses are incredibly different. Um, and you see a lot of people throw around the word startup now. You know, there's like lady startup, startup here, I did a startup, all this kind of stuff. I don't think they're actually startups. So when I think of what a startup is, like most people, when they say I'm doing a startup, you know, they start a cafe and they're like, I've, I've, start, I've got a startup. That to me is not what the pure kind of definition of a startup. And that was that it's an organization that's formed to um, scale using a repeatable business model. So it obviously can scale with technology, not people. And even today's uh, climate, you know, you have companies that might be not really startups, but they're playing in the startup space. And I don't think anyone here works at WeWork or companies like that. But some of those startups that are really people dependent startups have uh, struggled with scale because they're still really like not super technical startups. So the more that you can use technology to help with scale, the more chance that you will go on to um, be a larger company. And this is Paul Graham, who's the founder of Y Combinator. And he just talks about startups being designed to grow fast. So it doesn't matter if they're newly founded. It doesn't matter if it's calling itself a startup. It's, um, you know, a company that is going to grow at a certain speed um, and be obsessed with growth. Now, what does growth mean? So we know that we, you know, think about growth, but I think people um, don't really get obsessed with growth early on enough. So for instance, you might be thinking about, oh, one day I'll get more Instagram followers. You know, people, what that's what I call like maybe a vanity metric. It won't really bring in any direct revenue to your company, but people kind of get obsessed with those kind of growth um, things that they can monitor. But growth could be anything. So it doesn't even have to be sales-based. If you're working on something like we had... Um, Hannon from Aero, which was the uh, first batch of Atto, a circular economy marketplace um, for fashion, secondhand goods that's now partnering with um, uh, Afterpay and uh, uh, Iconic and companies like that. So she might be just looking at how many listings, like what's the rate of growth on the listings on my marketplace? And is that growing at you know 20% week on week? So it's about picking a metric that's going to, um, result in significant growth for what you're doing and you never can be too early to get obsessed with growth um, so you know even if it's survey respondents we have a lot of people that you know uh, through Atto they'll create a survey to do customer discovery and you know even getting um, the number of respondents is a really great metric because you can see if people are interested you know you're getting 50 or 100 people respond to your survey that's a sign that people are interested in what you're doing. They're happy to invest their time and complete the form. So just these little wins and changing your mindset early on to be focused on growth um, is important. Another thing is people get confused and focus on uh, activities. So they're like, today I will be doing, you know, I'll write that blog post. I'll schedule some tweets. I'll set up Stripe payments. You know, they might have a task list. But again, that's not really a growth orientated mind that's just tasks so you might um send that to oh by the end of the week i want to get five um people that have completed checkout on stripe or something like that so you're turning it around to make your tasks growth-minded tasks um, and there's just a chart here about linear versus exponential growth um, and a lot of startup um decks and information people will focus very early on in this linear growth and they'll like distort their charts to make it seem like they're you know up and to the right because there's obsession with that but really you're trying to look at something that is going to grow exponentially um, and uh, over time it just gets bigger and bigger now i will be talking a little bit about the indie way shortly but at the moment i'm talking about tech startups so i don't think it has to be all or nothing you have to grow exponentially or you're a failure that's not what i preach at Addo at all but for the sake of this intro this is the expectation if you're running a tech startup that you'll be growth minded 
this is an example of Canva. So Canva, I think at the moment is probably the world's best female founded startup with Melanie Perkins. I think the Canva story is incredible. I think she's a really great CEO. I would strongly recommending, recommend reading anything you can about Canva because I think it's just an awesome example, an Aussie success story and all of that kind of stuff. Um, this is their metrics of uh, as of August 2021. They, these would already be well outdated, but you can see what they're measuring, what they're focused on. They've got things like a, 120 designs that are created every second. So again, you wouldn't think that that is a metric that you would be obsessed with or you, you would put on you know, growth. But the thing about that metric is that actually creates user engagement, user eng engagement creates stickiness, retention, that then goes into you know, um, paid upsells. They, people go from the freemium plan, they'll start paying, then you can look at um, retention, churn on subscriptions. And then all of a sudden, you know, you've got a billion plus in annualized revenue. So these kind of things, focusing on the right metric early in your startup can have a big um, impact later on. Any questions about that? All righty. Great. Now, just on the type of tech startup, this uh, diagram just talks about the differences again between small business owners, what they call lifestyle entrepreneurs and venture backed entrepreneurs. And again, this is just an example of how the industry segments itself. So if you said, oh, I need to go look for venture funding, but you're running an e-commerce um, company like we had in uh, two batches ago, Bubble Tea Club, they might not be a company that is traditionally venture backable by tech startup investors. So what they did is they raised on virtual, which is equity crowdfunding, they raised 1.6 million. So it's kind of knowing what you're doing and uh, understanding what options and pathways and blueprints there are for companies uh, like that and not getting super confused. I see a lot of people that, again, might go, I'm going to go reach out to Blackbird or um, you know, first round capital or these large capitals, but they're not really running a venture back startup. And just first things on that, that is completely okay. You don't always have to be running a venture backed tech startup. I think all sites, uh, types of startups are brilliant. I don't even use the word lifestyle entrepreneurship because I think there's a middle ground and that's what I call the indie way or indie companies. So they're not, you know, they don't always have to be lifestyle small businesses they don't have to be venture backable businesses but they're real technology businesses that are selling a product um, and they're profitable driven so a lot of tech startups they're not profitability obsessed because they want to reinvest any funds they make back into their company to keep on growing so they're obsessed with what I call growth at all costs so there is a really good middle ground the indie startup movement is fantastic. There's a resource at the end, which I'll share with you as well, if you want to find out more about that. And while this is all, why this is all applicable now is you kind of need to be making decisions early on about how you want to build your company, what kind of company you want to run, what kind of you know team, CEO, all that kind of stuff you want to do, because it, it's important now to set yourself up for success and you don't want to kind of be doing something and then you know, two years later, go, oh, well, actually, we should have been doing this or we should have been doing this. So it's good to think big, you know, and then super focused at the same time. The next thing um, I just wanted to share is different types of business models for your company. So, you know, you've got e-commerce, SaaS, freemium, subscription models, marketplaces, social networks, ad-driven models, paid content, drop shipping, data licensing, affiliate marketing, and then you've got companies that are like agency, agencies. But usually, you know, it's good to start thinking about a business model early on with what you're doing. Um, you don't need to have your pricing, you know, super figured out. You don't have to have all the plans, anything like that sorted. But just kind of knowing some sort of model that you'll be wrapping onto your product um, early on is great. Uh, again, I think we preach a lot at Addo about building revenue early because you the more revenue and obviously if you're self-sustainable, you are you have more power, you can decide how you want to grow, what you want to do and all of that kind of thing. So you don't want to leave monetization too late. 
you know, you can test this out and it can change as it will, and it will change forever. You know, pricing is never set. Pricing is completely fluid. It changes every single company, you know, zero accounting. They change their pricing almost every year. So don't get too uh, bogged down with the exact pricing, but start to explore business models early. And as you're launching an alpha and beta, try and get a business model in there. Don't go, you know, completely free beta, you know, try and get people to actually hand over their credit card details or, you know, do this early on to set that expectation that this is going to have a business model and a scalable one at that. Um, Now, obviously, subscription revenue, that's one of my favorites, just because the recurring revenue component, it just shows what happens when you start to get recurring revenue. So, That's why SaaS platforms are great. If you're thinking about running a marketplace, a lot of marketplaces now have SaaS components too. They're called SaaS marketplaces or market networks. There's a lot of options now where you can have recurring revenue subscription components in what you're doing. So it's it's something to think about how you're going to scale your revenue. Now, just in terms of um, startup life cycle, This just shows you uh, kind of what usually happens when people think about pre-seed. Pre-seed's usually the MVP. So during Addo, we're really at this pre-seed seed seed stage. Um, This is a startup lifecycle that's um, related to venture funding. So when you hear people say Series A, Series B, Series C growth, uh, this is kind of how, how it goes. And in here, there's the concept of product market fit. So that's when you really have kind of found something that customers want and you're starting to grow and it's all feel, everything's kind of aligning nicely. It's not as much of a slog uphill, but you can find product market fit multiple times. So you might find it at one stage and then as you start to to scale, you might need to tweak your product market fit a little bit further, you'll service different level clients and things like that. But for now, we're at this pre-seed seed stage. And um, again, understanding where you are also helps save you time. Because you might be like, oh, I need to go raise money. And you might start talking to Series A investors. And I can tell you that's a complete waste of time for the area that, you know, the stage that you're at. And most of the time, you know, they'll take the conversations, they'll build that relationship, but they have no in, in, in um, they have no, they will no not be investing at all. It will just be kind of leading people on. So it's, it's good to know where you are, how tech startup investment investing works, what, what you should kind of have by different stages. And um, at this moment, this seed stage, this, this could also be, you know, if this chart isn't really, doesn't have to be to scale because you could spend five years just on this like MVP, seed, product market fit finding exercise. Um, so uh, the faster that you can shorten that, the better as well. Now, This is a a curve, which is what it feels like to build a startup. So this is the the kind of um, startup curve that Y Combinator have kind of popularized, but it just shows you the feeling where you you might launch something, get a bunch of attention. It'll be super exciting. You might have a launch party. People will be interested in what you're doing. And then what happens is the novelty completely wears off and you're in what you call the trough of sorrow. Um, And again, this is a chart that really shows that pathway to finding product market fit, but uh, it's really hard. And this is why most people don't make it in startups, because to kind of keep believing in something and keep doing it when, you know, you're not getting any customers, your product's not finalized, no one really cares, all of that stuff, or um, there's a lot of problems crash, you're running out of money, you don't know if you should, you know, continue on doing this and all that kind of stuff. This is completely normal. This is what every startup goes through. It's a long process and it's super hard. And the more that you know that this is just what it's like, um, the easier it is to kind of stick at it and and navigate each phase. So we're we're right, you know, at the start here, we even we haven't had the tech crunch or the AFR or you know the the local piece of press or anything at the moment, but you're just on that kind of, this is when you've got the energy, this is should be the area where you've got the excitement and that, that pure belief. So um, it's to what's to come. This is just an example. We will be talking a little bit more about this later on, but just how, uh, depending on the stage you're at, how funding your startup usually happens. So at the seed, pre-seed stage, you know, usually it's savings. You might have um, 
created a little bit of a kitty or a, a buffer that allows you to work on your startups. At Addo, we really preach just um, not investing too much in building your startup early on, you know, so you can actually do quite a lot using no code tools and cloud services and, you know, lean hiring and stuff like that. Now it's, it, it's never been, you know, more affordable to uh, do a startup. So you, you shouldn't really be spending that much money at the moment. Um, but as you go and you need to scale, just some options. Um, so again, angels are usually early stage um, and then that's where you get more private equity and that kind of thing when you get to series C, D and beyond. And for companies that don't get there, there are options to have cash flow relief. So that's uh, another thing. And there's a new type of financing now called revenue-based financing. So in Australia, we see that with Tractor Ventures, but in the US, you've got NDVC, um, Earnest Capital, which um, I think they're called Calm Company Funding now. Um, but there's a lot of ways, again, that it's not all or nothing type funding. And I just want to touch on here, this is what it's like as a founder, you're doing everything. So, you know, you're wearing all the hats at any one time um, and really the buck stops for you. You have to figure out these things yourself. Um, th and this really never changes, even as you scale and you hire people. You know, I've made, uh, you know, hired a lot of people in the past, raised funding, and you think I'm going to hire this person to come solve my problems. But it never really happens that way. You know, as the founder, you, you will be you know, jumping in to solve a lot of problems and wear a lot of hats. So when you're, you know, coming at it, and you're like, I've never built a product before. This Atto experience is a great time to learn, you know, learn a little bit. Okay, how do I actually like um, get that landing page up? Okay, the DNS isn't working, something's wrong. How do I troubleshoot that? All of that kind of stuff. So the troubleshooting mindset is, is something that you need at all stages of your company building, uh, not just when you're a company of one. And as you scale further, you know, your team might start to resemble something like this. Um, this is kind of a sample of a start tech startup org chart, um, different types of teams that you'd have to recruit for your role, things like that. And, uh, you know, this is commonly known, but 90% of startups fail. Um, and common reasons that startups fail is no market need. Um, they ran out of cash, not the right team, get out-competed, pricing cost issues, um, poor product, lack of business models, poor marketing, poor you know, product mistimed in the market, lost focus, um, they've ignored customers, pivots gone bad, bad location, all of those kind of things. But again, if you find the right product market fit in the early stages um, through this customer discovery process, through this validation process, you know, most of the other stuff is a bit more academic because you can always figure out, you know, your, your burn rate, your, your cash for uh, cash, how to hire better people, how to become a better manager, how to do all those things, marketing, ad spend, all those things can kind of be figured out. But the number one thing you have to figure out is do people actually want the product that you have and what are they willing to pay for it and what value are you really providing and that kind of thing. Now, we've only got 10 minutes, but I thought this is something you could take away, um, potentially not do it live now, but um, this is something, you know, you've got things like the business model canvas, but I actually think that's even too overkill uh, for the early, early stage startup. Um, so what I did here, and this is in um, circle as well, so you can go, but try writing this out today uh, when you leave and say, look, what is my company name? You, if you don't have that, we'll figure it out over the next eight week. And what is your product? What is your product? And what does your product help with? And who, uh, who, who does it help? And then why does it help them? And then where is it available? And then how? So it's like kind of the who, what, uh, what uh, why, how approach. So, you know, saying I'd be like, oh, my company's name is Atto and my product is a startup school and accelerator for female founder. So it helps early stage female founders, largely non-technical with understanding how to um, scale businesses and um, connect them with resources. Our products are available online and we make money through, you know, we've got grant funding, um, program fees, things like that. So 
super simple exercise just to help with clarity over what you're doing. And again, sounds so straightforward, but when you ask people um, about the startup, majority of people will go on for hours about it could maybe do this and then we might be doing this and in the future it will do this and then we'll do this and this it's for everyone it's for everyone everywhere around the world you know and that's all of a sign that they haven't really you know kept it simple so the kiss principle make it super simple they also have the concept of wedge the startup wedge the product wedge or going niche to win or niche to win if you're in the us um, and that's where you start off super 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 focused on a super super tiny customer segment and you win that segment first before you start expanding um, and the benefit of that is that you really carve out a market position and you expand from there instead of going too horizontal or too large in focus first so that would be um, in my case, you know, if it was for Addo example, it'd be like, we're for everyone, no matter where they are in the world, we do every single different teaching in different languages, it's male, female founders, all of that kind of stuff. And then we'd basically be like another startup school, you know, we wouldn't have any uniqueness and how would anyone evaluate education. So the more that you go, okay, this is who we're for, people interested in no code, people are interested in getting things done themselves. The more that you narrow it down, the better you are in the early days. So you can't go too focused or too narrow in your um, early stage journey. The other thing is, this is just a, a way to evaluate where you're at, um, you know, finding something over the next couple of weeks, what you love, you know, your passion. Uh, I think passion is a word that's thrown around a lot, but often it is what your, your belief, your passion for something. You know, if you're, you're thinking about your startup in the shower, I think that's actually a good sign because it's something that, you know, you're really kind of keen to even just go in that mental headspace and troubleshoot and figure things out. So pick something you're passionate about. And that can be hard because often, you know, sometimes what you're passionate about uh, might not be where the business model lies and you might find yourself pivoting towards something and then slowly I joke that everyone becomes sales CRMs because, you know, it's always, everyone always can make money doing sales CRMs and you're just like, why am I a founder now of a sales CRM? So pick something you're passionate about um, and just recognize that within yourself. Um, and then, you know, look at your mission, uh, things like that, write these out, what your vision and mission is, just a couple of lines early on can just help you operate from a, a place of purpose and integrity and things like that. Um, and of course, we've got many experienced uh, leaders on the, the call. So, you know, you've often done exercises like this, but at the end of the day, it's, it's just important that you really believe in what you're doing, because if you get in the room and people even want to invest or, you know, you're getting this and uh, they're asking you all these questions. And if you really don't believe it, it's very evident in your gut. It's very obvious if people don't truly believe what in what they're doing. Now, just for some homework, uh, if you're interested in startup operations like 101 and accounting, um, this is a module that we can share. So these slides, if you click on this, it'll take you to the video. Um, I think this is really good to watch, even if you have run many businesses before, because this has just uh, things that are applicable for tech startups, things like agreements with employees, you know, um, equity, how all of that should be done, what should you be doing now? Um, and again, lots of people have run businesses before, but they still do things like, you know, hire a developer to build their startup without um, a con you know, proper contract in place. And as you scale, you know, if you actually become successful, then that just leaves you um, open to things like, well, I was the co-founder on that. I deserve this much equity, all of those kind of things. So there's a lot of things that you can do early on. To protect yourself, I always talk about building the fortress. So even though operations and legal isn't as important right now for you know product market fit, customer discovery, you just want to make sure that you're covered. So these things, these small things now that don't have to be um, costly to implement uh, don't become huge problems over time where you know it might might stop you from uh, getting funding and things like that. Um, so Luna startups. Um, they're in Australia, but Stripe Atlas for overseas peeps, that's a really good source of material as well. This will be customized a little bit more to Australian uh, incorporation, but there's so much out there as well for best practices for Delaware C Corps and things like that as you scale overseas. Okay, cool. We have this um, 
partner marketplace uh, which is also on circle so if at any time that you would like to say i'm going to set up stripe or i'm going to set up um salesforce crm or i'm setting up that go on here there's a lot of offers that you can get just to cut your cloud services and um software costs in the early days um, so recommend checking out our partner marketplace if you are looking at incorporating Luna, which I just mentioned uh, is $50 off for their incorporation packages, but have a click around and see things there. This, if you haven't watched this presentation already, uh, this is building a tech startup interview that Lana and I uh, jammed on a couple of weeks ago. Lana said it's worth watching, so I popped it in here. <laughs> so check that out if you've got time to watch stuff. Um, if you're interested in more of the indie way uh, content, you know what I mean by them, what pathways or options, if you want to bootstrap and scale or raise a little bit of capital and all of that, that presentation is worth a uh, watch too. We will be learning about no code tools, as mentioned with Romy. Um, this is a presentation that I did with Startup uh, Victoria about building no code MVPs. So again, that could be useful to watch uh, now just as background um, content. If you're in a co-founders and you haven't chatted about startup equity, there's a really great startup equity co uh, calculator that you can use here and you just can go down and it'll ask us who had the idea, who's been funding the idea, all of that kind of stuff. It's usually not recommended that co-founders are 50-50 in startups. Um, and I know that can seem harsh because, you know, we often want to collaborate and women It's you know, we want to be fair and things like that. But um, it's a good point for that because a startup journey, as we've said, is very long and not everyone will be committed. And you want to kind of have that um, ability for decisions to be made, for things to happen. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like it's the same thing if you had a board of directors, you kind of want to have a odd number just so decisions can be made and things can move forward. If not, everyone always agrees. The other thing is co-founding relationships are very tough. I've had co-founder breakups, things like that. So making sure all of this is, is you speak about it early on. Some people might have more time to work on a startup, less time, that kind of thing. So recommend having those tough conversations in advance and uh, putting things in this calculator and doing that. Again, it's one of those things that you think, we'll figure it out as we go along. And once we get some traction, we'll have those hard conversations. But Leaving it too late is incredibly costly. This, these are things that can happen at day one. 